Because we bring the blessing wherever we go, right? We're not just blessed in our homes. We're not just blessed in our surroundings, but we are carriers of the blessing. I tell you, that's why it's so important to be a blessing. I think that sometimes what can happen to us is, is we're very heavy on the blessing. And, you know, we're really going at it this year about living inside of the blessing of what God has for us. And sometimes we can forget why we talk about being blessed as much as we talk about being blessed. And I think that when I went there, you ever have those moments where like the light bulb goes off and not just like it kind of goes off, but you feel like you've been in the dark for a long time and all of a sudden it's like your light, your room was just intensified with light. That's how it was there. And I realized we talk about the blessing and we talk about being blessed. Yes, because we want to be blessed. Okay, put your hand up if you don't want to be blessed, right? Put your hand up if you want to be sick, right? No, no, uh, Jason, <laughs> right? Nobody wants that, but the blessing is so much beyond ourselves. And when we went to Gulu, that's what we experienced. We got to see the impact, even if just a small impact, that the blessing of God can have on an area, right? Like when you're walking into places, and this is no exaggeration, you have to remember, in Africa, we're talking about this is years and years, hundreds and, and potentially thousands of years, where essentially it's been the same thing. Okay, like sometimes to us, when we think about what life is like in Africa, it's hard for us to understand. But I'll give you an example. There is still mob justice right now in Africa. Okay, so we were told if we hit somebody, right, we're driving our large bus and we hit somebody on the road while we're driving somewhere, we are told you do not stop. You hit the person, you leave them on the side of the road, and you drive directly to the police station because if you get out of the bus and you go to try to help that person, people will swarm around you and they have the right to kill you because you killed somebody else, okay? Like, like we heard stories of there was thieves in the town and it, I mean, it keeps the, it really, it keeps the crime to a minimal. I mean, because when anybody has the right to just end your life. So there was thieves in the town, and we're hearing that people are just like catching them and putting tires around them and lighting the tires on fire. And this is the state of what this country is. And, and when you realize through the support of what you guys, what our ministry has had the ability to do, Gulu is becoming like a prototype for the country of Uganda. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, but so much more than just your, like, your small applause, but because let me explain it to you. Like we're talking about other government, uh, other people in governments of other cities. The United Nations is coming to Gulu. Like think about this. Th we're not talking about like we just found Africa, right? And so finally somebody is doing something because we didn't know. It. We're talking about thousands of years of people trying to help to rebuild an area. The United Nations is not short of ideas, but the United Nations is showing up to World Embrace's door to, get, to try to understand what are you doing that's making such an impact in an area. And this is amazing for World Embrace. Would I tell you something? World Embrace couldn't do anything except for the support that people like us send to them. Like, we're talking about the children's jail. These were children who were sleeping on mattresses that had holes in them and bugs in them and springs were like coming out of the mattress. And because of your support, children, children have mattresses to sleep on. Like one of the major problems in this jail was that the children were so undernourished that they were literally getting sick because they didn't eat breakfast. You guys, you're paying for these children to eat breakfast every single day. When, when we realize, yes, we talk about the blessing because we want our lives to be good, but I tell you something, it is so much beyond what sometimes our brains can see. And that's what happened to me when I got there. It was like I realized, like the playground that we went there to build, this is the first children's playground where kids have the ability to play for free, okay? 
when, when, when we went there, and we're building this, I was there with Reynold one of the days. Uh, Reynold is the, the guy, and David is his son-in-law. And we were there at the playground, and there was a bunch of men who were there working, and they were building kind of the walls that go around them. And we were laughing because we were asking them. This is a playground, right? Like in our area, a three-year-old knows what a playground is. We were asking grown men, like 25, 35 years old, what do you think this is? You know, none of the people there knew what it was. We are building through the support that we are, catch this, we are changing not just our lives and not just our family's life, but people who you will never see, children who wouldn't have the ability to play, to understand how to live as a child because of what you are doing, because of our partnership with another organization, we are literally giving life to people who otherwise would have not been able to have a life. I tell you, that's why, that's why we spend so much time talking about the blessing, because it doesn't take very long for you to realize that, yes, absolutely, one person can make a difference. That one person who honestly understands and actively is living inside of the blessing cannot just change one life. But you have the ability, when you're living in the blessing, to literally transform countries, nations, because of what God is doing in our life. That's what we have the opportunity to do. And so sometimes we can feel bad about this. We can feel like, you know, and sometimes people can, you know, they'll blab it and grab it, you know, they'll they'll name it and claim it. And hey, I'm guilty of that, right? I mean, who in here doesn't want to be blessed, right? We want to. But sometimes what we have to do is my dad is talking to us about understanding the blessing. It's we have to realize what he's talking about is so much beyond ourselves, And not to get caught up in just having enough for myself. But I want to live so far over the top because I realize the more that I have the ability to give, the more lives that I have the ability to change. And I'm telling you, that's what Africa was all about. The trip was, you know, mind you, my last experience in Africa was very difficult. (laughs) Okay. I feel like I referenced the, my last trip to Africa so much because I needed people to understand, you know, the gravity of my despair as I was in that part of the world. But it was so different being, you know, in the Sudan at the time that I was, you know, it was basically a wartime versus being in Uganda right now. And, and at the beginning, I was kind of bothered because I'm like, this is too easy. You know, I'm like going home, taking a hot shower, you know, and it's like when I was in the Sudan, it was like we had like a cup of water and you kind of like splashed it on your face and <laughs> hope that somehow in that you got clean. And I'm like, Lord, like, I don't understand how people are going to change. And the Lord totally redirected my understanding. Because I tell you something, when you're living in the blessing, life is not supposed to be hard. I'm, I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to say that over here. It's Barb, right? Barb knows. She's my go-to. I said, Barb, you know, when you're living in the blessing of God, yeah. your life, it doesn't have to be difficult. And that's what I realized when I went to Africa was I realized that life, when we live inside of the blessing, it doesn't have to be a challenge. It doesn't have to be a struggle. It doesn't have to be difficult. We don't have to live depressed. We don't have to live discouraged. But when I live inside of the blessing of God, the Bible promises me that God makes a way where otherwise there is no way. And that's what's happening through our support in the country of Africa is that God is making a way where man has tried for hundreds of years to try to make a way. God in one moment of time is building a path. He's weaving a path through the darkness and creating literally a region of righteousness right smack dab in the middle of the country because of what God is teaching us how to be a part of here. I tell you, it doesn't have to stop in just Gulu. That's what my brain kept going to. I kept saying this to them. Like, I can see this five, ten years from now. Cities like this spread all over the globe. Because I tell you something, the blessing knows no limits. There is no bounds. It doesn't, it's what I said constantly when I was there. The blessing doesn't just work in North America. It's not just for Canadians. It's not just for white people. It's not just for men. The blessing of God knows no limits. There's no boundaries to the blessing of God. It will happen in everybody's life, in any city, in any country, in any people group, as long as we understand what it looks like to live inside of the blessing. 
And so that's where I believe the Lord is taking us. That's why I believe God is spending so much time and going over and over and over again while we're making banners and why we're, you know, doing all the different things that we're doing because God is trying to help us to understand that my life can make a difference. Your life can make a difference. Like when you see the mattresses, you realize something. It's like, man, something that, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get home and sleep on my mattress. I got to admit, like, I have a very good mattress. It's like a pillow top on the pillow top. And it's like, I'm like a little cozy baby when I sleep, right? But man, when I look at those mattresses and you see like the new mattresses and the kids are smiling and they're well fed in the nurse and you realize, I did that. Because yeah. sometimes it could be out there, you know? But when you see it, when you witness it with your own eyes and you realize, I did that. It makes me realize why we go so hard at this, why we press about it, why we talk about it, why we preach about it, why we make banners about it. Because the world is waiting for somebody to change it. And I think for so long, we've always thought it, w- it must be somebody else. I'm even guilty of this myself, right? It must be someone else. It must be something else. It must be Watoto or Compassion. And then when you get there and you realize, wait a minute, sometimes changing the world starts with a mattress. Sometimes it starts with one person, and I have the ability to do that. And so that's why we talk about the blessing. That's why we focus on it around here, because we can, you can make a difference. You are destined to make a difference. Amen? Okay. So uh, I'm going to obviously talk about the blessing this morning, um, because I believe that that's what God is doing. Um, and one of the things that I discovered there, actually, let's read the, the Bible first, because the Bible is really what we came here for. Um, I'm going to read, I'm really just going to rip off my dad, because he's not here. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to preach his message. Um, we're going to read uh, Genesis chapter 17, and this is essentially talking about uh, wh- when God appears to Abram, and he changes his name to Abraham, which is when he initially extends to him the potential for the promise in his life, the potential for him to live inside of the blessing. Because this is essentially where I believe each and every one of us are. We are in a place where God has made a covenant with us to live, not just visit, but to live inside of the blessing, right? I don't want to just experience the blessing here and there. I want to live in it, right? I don't want to just have seen the blessing for two weeks when I went to Gulu, but I want to, for the rest of my life, I want people to be impacted by the presence, the power, the manifestation of God in and through my life. Can I get an amen? How many of you would say that's why I'm here, right? I don't come here because it's the right thing to do. I don't come here because of some religious attitude. I don't come here because Jesus is going to give me a gold star by my name. I'm here. You sit in these pews. You braved the storm because you believe your life can make a difference. And this, the blessing, living in the blessing is the way we change the world. I, I could talk about Africa forever. One of the things that you realize there is that you know, sometimes we've thought for so long, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Let's read the Bible. I actually have a message that I would like to preach. I'm telling you, man, you guys are amazing. Yes. Really? Like from the bottom of my heart, yes. the things that you have made possible in that city is breathtaking. It is amazing. Like when you walk around that city and you realize all we have done for the people there, it's like, sometimes you feel like, oh, small little church in Fort Erie, what could we do? A lot. Come on. A lot. And Gulu is not some small little village of 12 people. Gulu is one of the main up-and-coming cities in the country of Uganda. Yeah. Right? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that you are changing. Come on. You are. Because you understand the kingdom and you understand why we're blessed. Right? We're not blessed because we want to drive nice cars, although God bless you if you drive a nice car. We're blessed because people's lives need to be changed. This, the, wor- the, the Bible says that, right? The earth groans, it travails, it cries out for the manifestation of the sons and daughters, the people who understand how to live inside. The earth is waiting for us yes. because they don't know how to change. Gulu doesn't know how to change. If they knew how to change, they would have changed centuries ago. But they're waiting for a people who understand how to operate in the principles of the promise so that they can offer to them a solution of how to get out of the problems they've been facing. And they're welcoming it with open arms. Amen? Okay, let's read. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Say amen. Amen. 
Say amen better. Amen. amen. I also want to say, come on now for braving the storm, right? I mean, those slippery roads. Come on now. None of you got into car accidents. God bless you all. You know how to drive in a little bit of snow. Good for you, right? It's like literally as soon as the snow melts, people forget that we're Canadians or Americans who live in New York, right? And it's like we've literally, I was, first time I drove was in the snow. But I think there was like 550 car accidents yesterday in Toronto alone, right? Yeah, wow was right. Silly. I don't even understand that. Okay, let's read the Bible. So when Abraham was, ni- when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. You shall no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in, the, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word because we know your word is your promise and your promise is yes and amen. You give the promises, and you are the one who fulfills the promise. So I'm asking this morning, as we spend just a few moments in your word, Holy Spirit, that you would cause us to be not just hearers of your word, but doers. That we would not just be readers, but we would be believers. That you would open up our eyes and open up our minds to receive revelation from heaven, to understand that we already are living in the blessing. We aren't waiting to get there. We're not trying to get there, but we are blessed We are living in the blessing. We are the descendants that you are talking about in the story. We already have been given the promise. So Holy Spirit, open up our minds to be able to understand what that means. Thank you for your anointing this morning. As you spend a few moments in your word, I thank you that you bless it, that it goes forth and multiplies in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to try to be fast, even though I have three pages of notes here. So as fast as three pages of notes can be, right? Um, so what I've been discovering lately uh, is really that life is all about perspective. I, I think that was probably the biggest thing that I realized when I was in Africa, and probably every time that I travel around the world. I've been to a lot of different countries, um, and none of them really as amazing as Canada. One of the things that you find is, is that when people find out that you're from North America, people are interested and they want to know how can they get to North America, because to them, all of their problems would be solved because they got to North America. But then when you think about people who live in North America, people in North America think they need to go to other countries in order for other countries, you get what I'm saying, right? (laughs) Our life is all about perspective, and and that was one of the things that I realized there because in in the worst situations and in the best situations, there's some people who are positive and some people are negative, right? I remember the Lord spoke this to me probably about five or six years ago. He said to me, your worst day is a day that somebody is believing to live right? Your worst day is somebody's best day that they're hoping to one day be able to live in. And what is that all about for me? It's all about perspective. And I think that sometimes when we talk about the blessing, because we can, uh, 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 um, uh, we can, it's very easy for us to see all the areas of our life that aren't going the way we think that they're supposed to go. We would say that we really aren't living in the blessing, right? And as I was even preparing these notes, I was having a conversation with the Lord, and he was drilling into my mind this understanding that we aren't trying to get anywhere, okay? It's a very important understanding that we must have as New Testament believers. You already are everything you're ever going to be. Did you know that? Maybe you didn't know that, okay? When Jesus died on the cross for us, what he did was he made me a recipient of everything that God was ever going to do. Can I get an amen? That's what the message of grace is all about. The message of grace is is that whether you deserve it or not, whether you're good enough for it or not, whether you qualify for it or not, you have a right to, as a believer of Jesus Christ, you have a right to the blessing. You're never going to be good enough for it. You're never going to be smart enough for it. You're never going to do enough of the right stuff in order to qualify for it. But at the same time, you are a recipient of it. 
And I think that sometimes what can happen to us is when we're talking about the blessing, we feel as though it's a destination that we're trying to get to. And that's just not true. Okay? In the Old Testament, there were rules and regulations on how you had the, the, the ability to live inside of the blessing. Right? We all know these. You had to sacrifice the right things and do the right things and go to the right places and say the right stuff and live a certain way. And when you had the right or the ability to, you know, the very few people who had the ability to actually adhere by all of those rules, now for whatever season of time, maybe three days, maybe five days, maybe six months, because they were doing the right things, now they had the ability or God had the ability to pour the blessing of God on them. The new covenant is not that. It's actually not that at all, right? The Bible says that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. Do y'all remember it says that, right? When he died on the cross, he did one very specific thing. He took everything on me that would disqualify me from being able to live in the blessing and gave me everything that I would need to live there perpetually. Is this making sense? And so when I understand the blessing of God, what I must, the very first step that I take in this direction is I must understand that I already am blessed. This is what people in in Gulu would have said to me, right? I could have gone there. I didn't because I live an amazing life. But I could have gone there really upset about all the things about my life because how many of you know nobody's life is perfect, okay? It doesn't matter how good your life is, there's always something that makes it not perfect. And so we're not striving for perfection. What we're striving for is contentment, okay? That I'm happy with the fact of where my life is right now, even though I know that God is calling me to go farther. So when people saw me in Gulu, even though my life is not all together, even though there are things in my life that I know that I want to change, even though that happened and there's all these negative things about my life, my life in comparison to somebody who lives in Gulu who's trying to find the food to be able to eat for dinner, let's say, my life is outrageously blessed. Is this making sense? And so I am blessed. I'm living in the blessing, but my perspective plays a huge role in my understanding of actually how blessed I already am. And so when I'm talking about the blessing, it's not that I'm trying to get somewhere. Yes, I'm trying to get further down the road of the blessing so that my life can be more of a blessing to other people. However, my perspective must be that I already am blessed. I already live in the blessing. My life is better today than it was yesterday, which means my life is more blessed today than I was six months ago. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's where we must start the journey of understanding the blessing is that we already are blessed. Tell your neighbor, hey neighbor, I'm blessed. And so the reason the scripture tells me to rejoice The reason it tells me to rejoice, sometimes I can feel like, you know, I I rejoice because it's the right thing to do, right? No, but it tells me to rejoice because I can rejoice because I realize that I already am blessed. Am I where I want to be? No. Who is? Nobody is where we want to be, but I'm aware of the fact that the very fact that I have breath in my lungs and food to eat means that I'm living in the blessing to a degree. Because the scripture tells me that every good gift comes from the Lord, right? If it's good, it came from God. If it's good, it came from the blessing. So therefore, I must tell myself constantly, I'm not waiting to get somewhere. I already am blessed. It's a perspective change, but it's one that we must do or we constantly live trying to get somewhere that we already are. Okay, you with me? So... My, my example for this is, I was talking to the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, help me to make it easy. And he gave me this analogy of, of being wet. Because actually, I was watching YouTube videos, and there's this whole huge debate on, is water wet? Okay, I don't know if you ever heard of this. Okay, what is the thing? And so I've been, like, laughing about it as I'm watching videos. Um, but he said to me that, that for me to say I'm wet, right? Like, if I take my pinky toe, and I dip it in the water, and just my pinky toe is wet, I am still wet right? You understand? I am also dry. Thank you. That's the positive person. You know, glass half full, half empty. Okay. Now, if I dunk my whole body under the water, I would still say that I am. So whether I'm a little wet or a lot of wet, I am still. The blessing is exactly the same. Whether I'm a little bit blessed or I'm a lot of bit blessed, I am still
okay? And this is, but, but you see, this is a perspective change because so often what can happen to us is we can get so focused on the areas of our body that aren't wet instead of remembering the fact that, hey, wait a minute, I'm a little bit wet. And if I just keep walking in this direction, if I just keep walking a little bit deeper in the water, it's not going to be long before my whole body is living and swimming in the blessing. But the problem is, is that so often what human nature can do is we could spend so much time thinking about the areas of our life that aren't wet instead of the areas that are wet as we just stand still. And this is mostly the issue, not that people aren't good, not that you don't know the word, not that you don't have faith. The problem for most people is they spend so much of their life focusing on the wrong things. This is the biggest thing that I was talking to people about in Gulu is trying to help people to understand that we have the same problems as you have. That although my problems may be different, we still all have problems. And as long as, you stay, as long as you live thinking that somehow I have to go somewhere else or be somewhere else or do something else in order to be blessed, you're never going to get blessed. I, you're trying to, it's that syndrome, right? The grass is greener syndrome where we would think, you know, if it was just for this, if it was just for that, if it was just for this, if it was just for that, that then I would be blessed instead of realizing, wait a minute, I already am blessed. Let me focus on my blessing. And the more that I focus on the blessing, it's amazing that then I get more blessed. Isn't that what the scripture tells us about Thanksgiving? What Thanksgiving is literally the language of faith. We read constantly, right? I mean, I, I was reading through yesterday as I was just kind of like putting some final touches to my notes. Just with all the different scriptures that talks to us about rejoicing or giving thanks. And it's crazy. And you know what I realized more often is that God tells us to rejoice and give thanks more often in bad situations yeah. than he does in good situations. I mean, go study it out in the Bible. It's actually funny how often in a horrible situation, God will write, or through a writer or through whoever, God will write to rejoice or to give thanks. And I'm thinking about it, Lord, why are you doing that? But I realized something, that if we focus on our problems, how many of you have ever talked your problems away? You ever done that? You ever got so bummed out by your problems that your bummed outness beat your problem? Anybody ever get there? Did you ever actually have a pity party that actually led you to happiness? Has anybody ever done that, right? Have you ever complained so much that you got into a good mood, right? <laughs> Nobody has ever done that, okay? But sometimes what can happen to us in our culture is we forget that rejoicing and thanksgiving is literally the doorway out of my problems. It's literally the pathway that God has created. It's a mechanism that God uses to change my situations. Why? Because I stop myself and remember what? I am blessed. I'm not waiting to be blessed. I'm not trying to get blessed. No, I am blessed. And the more that I release the blessing out of my mouth, the Bible tells me that life and death is in the power of the tongue. The more that I release the blessing of God over my life, the more that my life begins to look like the blessing of God. You see, the blessing is simple, but we have to remember that I'm not trying to get there. I'm not trying to be good enough. I'm not trying to tithe enough. I'm not trying to give enough. I'm not trying to do rhema enough. I'm not trying to meditate enough. Although those things are amazing. And those are tools that we use to change ourselves. Wow. Okay. Like, it's one of the revelations I got a few years ago through one of my dad's messages that my dad is so wise. How I many of you are thankful for my dad, right? Yeah. He's, yeah. You know, that was one of the things, let me sidebar, that was one of the things that I was so aware of in Uganda when I was there in Gulu was how well we have been trained and equipped to live inside and understand the kingdom of God. Amen. You know, because we pray that, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it, it's like ritual. Yeah. But it's like we've been trained to understand how to live in and manipulate the kingdom of God here on earth. And yeah. I tell you, I believe more so than ever that, you know, I'm sure there are going to be old bits of revival that look like the way they were. But I tell you something, this new revival is going to look like the kingdom. And you have been, I have been, we have been equipped to literally be the kings and queens of the kingdom when it arrives. Yeah. Amen? So, where was I? Okay. So let's actually go back to the story, the Bible story about Abram. Because this is really what Abram did, and this is what Abra or Abraham, this, is, this was his thing. 
And sometimes we can make the scriptures so complex, right? I love to make the scripture complex because then it gives me an excuse of why it's not working in my life, right? That's what I like to do. I like to always search for the secret as to why I'm not experiencing it. But a lot of the times, the reason we're not experiencing it, let me look at myself for a minute on the screen. The reason you're not experiencing it over there is because you're really just not disciplined enough to just keep doing it when it gets difficult, right? And that was to me. I don't know about you. That was to me. The guy up there with the shaved head. Looks good, right? How's the hair? It's pretty good, right? (laughs) And so that's what we see in the story of Abraham is that Abraham's life wasn't perfect, right? It wasn't, there was nothing special about him. There was, you know, he was just a guy. And, you know, God comes to him and gives him this amazing promise that you're going to be the father of a multitude. But the odd thing about the story, as probably most of you know, is that Abraham didn't even have one child, Okay, so we realize here, so Abraham was 99 years old at this point, okay? So it's not like he was like 15 or 16, and he just hadn't started trying to have children yet, okay? Because, you know, that's what we like to do with our kids, right? Is we like to train, you know, train the child up in the way she goes, somebody's old, they will not pray. We like to speak the blessing of God into children, but this was not Abraham's story. This is a 99-year-old man who I'm sure, right, he had a wife, And so I'm pretty darn sure, you know, they had, you know, really given it a shot to have a kid, right? It wasn't like they couldn't figure out what to do, right? I'm pretty sure they knew what to do in order to have a kid, okay? And, but they had no children. And so a lot of us, we can find ourselves in this story simply because we, we, we face those things. God gives us a promise and our life in the moment that he gives us the promise, our life looks nothing like the promise. Okay, how many of you God has given you a promise and you're already living in it, right? No, none of us. God gives us promises to tell us what our future is going to look like and it's the same thing he did for Abraham, okay? But what Abraham did was so valuable is when God, you know, God called him, changed his name from Abraham to Abraham, but like my dad says, that wasn't just like a name, okay? It wasn't like God comes to me and he says, you once were called Alex, now you're going to be called Reggie, okay? That's not what it was, right? It wasn't like that. It wasn't, and so now I'm Reggie, and you're all like, that's weird. You're Reggie. That's, okay, cool. I guess Pastor Reggie, awesome, right? (laughs) That's not what it was like in Abram's life, is that Abram, it was literally like a description, okay? It would be like you called me white guy, okay? And so this is the description of who I am, and it would be really weird if all of a sudden I started going by purple guy, okay? Because you'd be like, you're a white guy, you're not a purple guy, why would you call yourself purple guy when you're a white guy, okay? But this is essentially what Abraham did. When he became Abraham, what he was doing every time he introduced himself to anybody, as he was speaking, he wasn't focusing on, because I tell you something, sometimes we would do that, right? I've done that is God changes my name to Abraham, he gives, gives me a promise, and I'm like feeling like a total turd to say to people, you know, the blessing that God has for me. And so out of my modesty, right, I will continue to introduce myself as Abram, right? Hello, I'm Abram. Even though God has given me a promise that I'm Abraham, I only speak. And that's sometimes what we can do, is we can get so focused on our shortcomings that we forget that the promise of God is all we need in order to live in the promise of God, yeah, 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 okay? Yeah. And so that's what Abram did, is that Abram forced himself in the moments of, even though his life didn't look any different, he prophesied constantly over his life saying that I'm not father, I'm not childless, but I'm the father of many nations, right? Hello, I'm the father of many nations. Hey, Bobby, I'm the father of many nations. Hey, John, I'm the father of many nations. And you see, this is the model that we must adopt because sometimes what can happen to us is we forget why the blessing of God is so important. We forget why talking about the promise is so important, and that's why I believe that literally on the beginning of us going into this topic about the blessing, God sends us to Africa so we have a visual understanding, a representation to us of how important it is, critically important for us to understand how to live inside of the blessing. And so we see all that God asked Abraham to do, and this is sometimes where it can get challenging is that all God did to Abraham was he changed, he changed what he said about himself. And man, that can sometimes bug me. Because I want it to be that God gave Abram the 85-step solution 
to having children. That's what I want it to be. I want it to be that he got the ABCs, the one, two, threes of faith, and because he worked the word and meditated on the promises of God, that that was the, it wasn't that. All, you read it, literally all God did, the only instruction, come on, like, the only instruction Abram got was, stop calling yourself Abram, call yourself Abraham. How powerful are the words that we speak over our life? How much power and authority have we been given to change those situations? But what? It's a perspective shift. It's a change. Because what? I focus now on what God has done instead of what I'm waiting on him to do. And so that's what I thought about, actually, because I, I prayed a couple of prayers over some of the people there, and I prayed blessings over them, because you know, the scripture is actually full of blessings that we all could pray over ourselves, right? Like there's a, Daniel prays a blessing, and uh, uh, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all, there's like literally tons of blessings that get prayed over people. And so I was praying them, and I realized that sometimes I think what can happen to us is the context of the blessings. You know what I mean? Like you will eat the fat of the calf, you know, we're thinking like, that's gross, right? <laughs> you know, or like you will inherit kingdoms, right? And you're like, it, that's, I, I live in an apartment, right? Like, what does that even mean, right? And so sometimes it can be challenging, right, for us to understand what it looks like to live in the blessing because it's all Old Testament. Like you own a cattle on a thousand hills and you're like, I, I'm not a farmer, right? Like maybe that would work for Don and Brad, but I mean, it's not gonna work for me. Like, <laughs> Lord, don't give me cows. I have literally nowhere to put them, Okay. <laughs> could barely fit my cars in the driveway, let alone cows, okay? And so I went through the Bible, just like very, very quickly, and I took a look at all the different stories of uh, uh, just like people who lived inside of the blessing, because I wanted to know what does the blessing look like? Like what were the notable things that people experienced as the blessing? And let's put it into our own language, because I think that sometimes we honestly don't know. Like, it, it, I, I've gone through seasons like that where you're like, the only good thing in my life is that I woke up this morning and I have breath in my lungs, right? Like, that was like deep in a pity party at some point, right? But we can forget sometimes what the blessing of God looks like. And so give me two seconds, and I'm going to read to you. Let's go through the scriptures and read what the blessing of God looks like. Okay, you ready for this? I wish I had some music because this just sound way better. In my head, it's like this is a commercial, and so it'd be awesome, Okay. So here you go. You ready for this? These are evidences that these people lived in the blessing. Are you ready? Adam got married. Noah had a boat. Abraham was rich and Sarah had kids. Jacob had good relationships. Joseph had nice clothes. Moses could speak well. Joshua could walk. Saul was tall. David could play music. Absalom was attractive. Solomon was wise and Ruth knew how to get her man. Okay. <laughs> Elijah and Elisha always had food to eat. Daniel had a way with animals. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bold. Esther had favor. Jonah was given a second chance, and Jeremiah was compassionate. Mary got to travel. Joseph was easygoing. Peter was forgiven, and Lazarus got his family back. Matthew was good with numbers. Mark was good with languages, and Luke was good with details. Jesus had a vehicle. Blind Bartimaeus could see. Paul had a good memory. Barnabas was, ge well, Barnabas was generous, and the apostle John was the one who Jesus loved. Okay, and so we realize from this very simple analogy how many of these things, notable things that people got written about in the Bible about why they were blessed, these are very common things in our life. Like as I wrote the story, I realized how many of the things in the Bible would have been like things that would have defined my life. Like we could write about Alex because I have so many of these things on this list active in my life. But sometimes what can happen is, and even as I'm writing the list, I'm noticing all the things on here that I don't have or that I wish were better. Oh, that, I know, it hit me too. Like, real. Uh, uh. But when I take a look at this, I realize something, that it's honestly easy to live inside the blessing when we understand what we are, what we're looking for, right? Like, I mean, Adam got married, 
right? Like, that was a big thing. Like, he got a wife. And it was like, oh, my gosh, right? And sometimes what I can do is, like, I complain about my wife, right? <laughs> not my wife. No, no, not my wife. She's an angel sent from heaven from above to me, right? We can complain about our kids. We can complain about our cars. We can complain about the thing. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we've got to live with the same thing or you don't have to be a martyr. And accept. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that what we must do, like Abraham, is change the things that are coming out of our mouth. Because I tell you something, when the Bible tells us to rejoice in the Lord always, it isn't just the right thing to do. Right? It's not just, you know, I should do it, and so I guess I'm going to try to do it. No, I rejoice in the Lord because of something very simple. I rejoice because I realize that I already am blessed, right? I already am blessed. Like, maybe I'm not where I want to be. Maybe I'm not where I know that I'm going to be. Maybe I've only seen God fulfill one promise in my life, but I can be sure of one thing. The very fact that God gave me the promise means that God is absolutely 100% prepared. He's already made the road for it. He's already sent angels before me to do it. He's given me the anointing of God to accomplish it. Everything that I need in order to be blessed, God has already done. So now when I rejoice, I'm not rejoicing because it's the right thing to do. I'm not trying to rejoice to get myself out of my pity party. I'm rejoicing because I realize, God, you have already done so much in my life. So why would I expect that my future is going to be any different than my past? Why? Why would I think that? God, you've saved me. You've delivered me. You've prospered me. You've changed me. You've showed up when I didn't deserve it. You've done things that I could never have done. You've made impossible things possible. Why would I expect that my future is going to look any different than my past? That is why we talk about the blessing of God. And so I want to do something. I want us to respond. I feel like there's something that happens to us when we respond externally to something that God is doing internally. Because I believe that as we hung these banners today, that, that, that God is, th these aren't just banners, it's not just a good idea. It's what God is getting us prepared to do. And I think that sometimes when we talk about the blessing, we talk about faith, we talk about these things, sometimes what can happen to us is because we've had the wrong perception, the wrong perspective of the situations that we've gone through in our past. And, and trust me, I'm not pointing fingers at here. I've gone through my own handful of situations that I've had wrong perspectives in. But sometimes what can happen to us is we're getting ready, we're like ramping up to, to really go after the blessing of God. It's like I've built a wall around myself of all the past disappointments that I've gone through. All the past times that I've tried to do something and it didn't work. All the past times that I've stepped out and it didn't happen. All the past times that, that I thought I stood on the word and it didn't happen the way I thought it was supposed to happen. And so because of that, we put up the signs and we talk about it and we preach the messages, but so often we can leave in these places and because we've got our walls of disappointment around us, we leave and our lives are not changed. And I don't believe that that's what God is doing this morning. I don't believe that he put the signs up and had me preach this message so we could leave and not be different. I don't want to just talk about the blessing. I want to live in the blessing. I don't want to just talk about changing lives. I want to be the agent of change. I don't want to just have mattresses in one jail. I want to put mattresses in every jail. Because somebody is doing that. Like there are people, like, you, you, I don't know if you've ever done this, but re read about what Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Association, their charity is doing around the world. It's staggering. We've got, we've got a, a little bit of time to talk about what Toto and what, 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 what Toto, what one man has done in a country. Like we're talking about, you don't see orphans. Like when you were there, right? We didn't see like children, orphans running around. Now, that's not just Wototo. Obviously, there's many organizations that have come, but the one that we know of is Wototo. And we're talking about one person. This is your destiny. It's my destiny to change the world. There's one thing that I came home with. I said this to my dad. There's one thing that I came home with. As I came home with a renewed understanding that I can honestly change the world. 
I think for so long in Christianity, we've done this as we said it. You've said it, I've said it, we've done it. We've said, I'm gonna change the world. And for all of us, because you're just like me, in the back of our heads, we're like, you're gonna change the world? Yeah, okay, buddy, okay. <laughs> but I tell you something, when I went there and I stood on the playground, you know, and as I shook hands with the young teens who were in jail and a bunch of the different places and different things, I realized something very valuable. We can change the world. You can change the world. Maybe you can't change the whole world, but you could change somebody's world. And sometimes we can see the bigness of the world and the problems and the chaos. And we can get discouraged. But it was amazing. That $10, $1,500 that you put in that offering. Like, I think about that. This morning, when those boys woke up in that jail, they ate breakfast because of me. Because of you. You are changing the world. And we talk about the blessing for one reason. Because I don't want to just stop in Gulu. Being there made me aware of one thing, and I came home with it, and I, I said to my dad, like, we need to put one of these in every major city in the world. Because once you taste it, once you experience it, once you see that mattress or you hand out that meal, it does something on the inside of us. I, I want to be blessed. I want my child, when it's born, I want it to live in the, I don't ever want to have to worry about a thing I wanted to know that God is with, and, and yes, I want, I want that for my wife, and I want that for my family. But the blessing of God is so much beyond that. It's for your family, and for people in the city, and people in our country, and people in Gulu, and people in Kampala, and people spread throughout the globe. You can change the world. So I'm going to ask you for two seconds. I'm done. Let's just close our eyes. Because I believe that God is looking for a response this morning. And I tried my best to make you laugh and hype you up. But this is really where I wanted to get to. Because my prayer is that in my attempts to give you an image of what I got to experience firsthand, my prayer is that you would understand the way that I did when I walked onto the ground of that city the reality that we can do this. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you, I'm going to count to three and we're going to stand up. Because like I said, I believe there's something that happens internally when we make an expression externally. When we stand, it's not just standing. When you raise your hand, it's not just raising your hand. It's solidifying that you are responding to what God is doing. And, and I believe that what God spoke to me is that in our standing what we're doing is we're standing up out of our insecurity. We're standing up out of our discouragement and we're standing up out of our depression and we're standing up out of our performance mentalities and we're standing up out of anything that would try to make us feel as though we can't be or we aren't the people who God has called us to be, the people who Jesus died so that we could be. And so as we stand, what we're doing is we're reminding ourselves we're reminding the enemy and all the demonic forces that we aren't the people to be messed with, that we are the people who God has prophesied about for thousands of years. We are the people that the earth and the ground is groaning and travailing for. We are the children of God who are going to do the greater works. So all I'm going to ask you to do is very simple. You can keep your eyes closed. You don't have to look around. But when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to believe that there's an anointing here. And what that anointing is going to do, it's going to break you free. So this is how we're going to start. I apologize if I'm taking too long. 
we're going to ask the Holy Spirit this. You're just going to say, you can repeat this after me. Say, Holy Spirit, show me what's holding me back from living in the blessing. This is going to show you something, a mindset, a memory, a situation, something you went through, a time that you tried. I don't necessarily know what it is. He's going to show you something. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe you've already dealt with it, and that's also fine. But he's going to show it to you. He's going to take you to that spot. And so I want to say, just say, Jesus, I invite you into this memory. So he's going to show up. You're going to see him. You might feel him. might seem like it gets brighter. Any change we identify as Jesus showing up. Now what I want you to do is very simple. When you see him, you know he's there. I want you to ask him this question. Just say, Jesus, tell me the truth. So he's going to speak something to you. He's going to give you a new perspective. He's going to tell you something was with you. I love you. I was the one who caused this thing to not happen. I know you felt alone, but you weren't alone. I love you. And what I want is when you feel like he's spoken to you, I'm just going to ask you to stand up. And I'm going to pray over you. And as you're standing, what you're doing is you're saying, it's an act of your will that you're stepping up out of this old mindset, this old mentality. to this city, to Gulu, so that we could see, to be partakers of what he's getting ready to launch out of this house in a greater dimension. And I believe this morning what he's doing is he's asking us to be partakers of what he's getting ready to do. So you can just lift your hands. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, as I stand here, Lord, I also am a partaker of this. And what you are desiring to do in us. Lord, just like it says in Psalms, God, that you would cause our paths to drip with abundance. You drip with abundance. And like John 15 says that we're in you and you are in us. And so we're partakers, not because we deserve it, not because we've done something special, but we're partakers because you, King Jesus, are victorious. So we choose right now, Heavenly Father, as an act of our will to release. I just want you to see that, that you're just putting distance between you and that old memory. Like maybe you're pushing it away or you're seeing Jesus standing in between you and that memory. We choose as an act of our will to take a step away from, from this memory, from this situation that has tried to stop us from living in and being partakers of the blessing. But we declare, Heavenly Father, right now, today, we are ready, Father, to be partakers of what you are desiring to do. We say, God, we are blessed, we are strong, we are healthy, we are wise, we are energetic. Father, we are everything that you have said we were. And so we choose, God, to let our mouths proclaim the praises of who you are. We are not speaking any longer out of our mouths where we are or what we have. But we declare, God, that you put a guard on our mouths and a watch on our tongues. That we would, like Abraham, not speak about our problems, but that we would say what we want, God, because we know that you have made a way for us. And we thank you, Lord, as we've stood, as we've declared our will, Lord, we thank you that we stand in the authority that the cross has given to us. And we say yes, in Jesus' name, amen.